my great privilege to welcome Polly Higgins here to the JCU campus, of um, Cairns campus. Polly really needs no introduction. She's a barrister and an environmental lawyer. Many of you will know that she's proposed a United Nations law to criminalise ecocide. It is said by some that Polly has made the earth her client. Voted by the ecologists as one of the world's top 10 visionary thinkers, Polly has put before the United Nations the proposal for ecocide to be made a crime, the fifth crime against peace, to sit alongside with other crimes such as genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes and crimes of aggression. In 1948, the United Nations created the crime of genocide in, res in response to the mass killings which arose out of the World War II period. Our speaker is going to argue that it is now mass destruction of the planet and there are no mechanisms to address this injustice. Polly has proposed a definition, a useful definition of ecocide, and I quote, as the mass damage destruction to or loss of ecosystems of a given territory, whether by human agency or by other causes, to such an extent that peaceful enjoyment by the inhabitants of that ter territory has been severely diminished. Holly urges the UN to take action to protect the planet by agreeing to law that could see individuals and companies involved in destructive acts and industries to face trials in the International Criminal Court. In her address tonight, our speaker will talk about the need for enforceable, legally binding mechanisms in international and national law to hold to account perpetrators of long-term severe damage to the environment. Please join me in welcoming Ms Polly Higgins in what promises to be a very stimulating talk. Ms Polly Higgins. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen and uh, other friends who are joining us from Monash and I believe Townsville as well. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to be here today. It's an absolute delight and it's also very exciting actually to be in a hall that's using such sophisticated technology as this to hook up with other universities. It's something I greatly believe in and I see universities using this increasingly, not just universities. This is part of the new world and for someone who is involved in creating the laws for the new world, I really very much enjoy engaging in those that are, are, are doing so themselves. But I also wish to honour uh, past generations and those whose lands we are on today. I also want to honour future generations because in part my work is to do with not just our generation, uh, not just as human beings, but uh, all beings and also what we can do to help protect the life of all beings for future generations as well. So, turning to ecocide, I, the proposal that I've made into the United Nations. Well, what I'd like to do, first of all, is talk a little bit about crimes against peace. I, often there's little understanding as to why crimes against peace actually have evolved as a body of, of international law in the first place. In fact, it's to do with morality. It's really to do with the sacredness of life. And sometimes when we're busy dealing with law at any given level, we forget to examine the premise why laws have been put in place initially. And when we start looking at it as something that is based on a morality, then we can understand why law even happens in the first place. Sometimes we actually get to a stage where we recognize that no longer should we do something no longer should we behave in a certain way, uh, and so therefore we need to close the door to certain activity. For instance, genocide, World War II, it took mass destruction of humanity for us to eventually get to the point of saying, enough, we now have to close the door to that. And that was a lawyer back then, Raphael Lemkin. And Raphael Lemkin, rather like me, got on his soapbox and went to many countries to say, you know, we need to protect human right to life. 
But just as our right to life needs to be governed by an international crime of genocide, so I'm saying it's not just human life, but in fact we can extend that out. So crimes against peace is largely to do with the well-being of human life. It acts as umbrella law, umbrella legislation, so principles of universal validity which apply to the whole of civilization. Now that's not to say that the whole of civilization adheres to these crimes against peace, but the recognition is, is that action can be taken when others fail to uphold it. It's about creating a universal outline. It's about saying, okay, now we have to stop, now we have to close the door. And we've done it, we've done it before in history, not just with genocide, we've done it with apartheid as well. I also want to take a step back before we look at what that extension of, of the well-being of life is about and just pause for a moment to look at the well-being of human life. Now, in law in Europe, where I, I, I'm based in London, we already have the principle of the human right to life very well enunciated in European legislation under the European Convention for Human Rights, which is the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And what we have is we already have a body of law there that tells us something very interesting. Because we already have case law that points out that where countries, member states, have a legal duty to prevent foreseeable loss of life or injury to life, and where there is knowledge of the existence of a risk to human beings from acts of a third party, such as dangerous industrial activity, then those countries have to put in place the laws to stop the crimes against humanity. And I'm saying that, in fact, the crime of ecocide, damage and destruction to the earth, is a crime against humanity. It's also a crime against nature. But our starting point, even with ourselves, what we're looking at is damage and destruction that's now got into such a high level of escalation. And if we're looking at it within the context of measuring that in climate change terms, what we're looking at is the escalation of excess greenhouse gases caused by industrial activity. That is putting a risk to human life. So we already have case law that says where there is, is a risk to life, we need to close that door. This hasn't been tested yet, but we're going to see how this plays out in a courtroom on the 30th of September in the UK, in the Supreme Court, where we're going to put ecocide on trial, and it's going to be live streamed right across the world. It's going to be real barristers, real QCs, real judge, real jury, and we're going to try one of, it could be many ecocides, you'll have to wait and see on the day, but it could be damage and destruction to the Amazon, it could be fracking, it could be open cast mining, it could be unconventional tar extraction, it could be Arctic drilling, it could be an oil spill. So who can for the day and see whether or not the argument for the right to life is made out before we even move on to the wider right to life for the earth itself. So we already have in place four crimes against peace. And this is set out in the Rome Statute. We already have genocide. We already have crimes against humanity. We already have war crimes. And we already have, which just actually was put in place last year, crimes of aggression. That's the run-up to war. Now these are largely to do with the well-being of human life. But I'm saying well, all we need to do is extend that not just to human life, but to all life. And that's where the fifth crime comes into play, and that's a missing crime, that's ecocide. Also, we already have an international criminal court. And this is very important. The International Criminal Court is a very recent development. It was put in place in 2002, and it sits in The Hague. The first case was brought in, in 2006, so we've only had four or five years of the International Criminal Court being in place. But this is a very important development that we have because prior to the International Criminal Court being in existence, what we did was we set up international tribunals that were situational specific 
So the Nuremberg War Trials was just put in place for the Nuremberg, uh, for the aftermath of World War II. A Rwanda, Yugoslavia, we put tribunals in place after the event. What was recognized was that it's actually it's too late once you've has, had vast destruction of humanity to then go in and set up a tribunal. And indeed, the International Criminal Court acts as a very powerful policing mechanism in its own self. Believe it or not, uh, numbers for genocide have fallen dramatically in the last few years. I'm not entirely sure how this is measured, but this is from the ICC itself. And I have seen footage of a nutty insurgent up a mountain debating uh, whether or not to go down the other side and, and kill a few thousand people and discussing the concerns about being hauled up in front of the ICC in The Hague. Because before that, the biggest problem was, was that you were rather dependent on national states taking action. And very often where you had genocide or crimes against humanity happening, you'd have a government that was largely complicit in it, or at least turning a blind eye. And other governments maybe not wanting to take action. So what we have here is what I call pre-existing hardware. We've got the United Nations. We've already got the umbrella term. It's embodied now in the Rome Statute, Crimes Against Peace, that sets out the four existing crimes. We've got the policing mechanism in the International Criminal Court. And we already have an expansion on the human right to life, which actually gives justification for new laws to be put in place to protect the human right to life. Now, hardware, as we know, often needs upgrading. And this is not to say that any of these are in desperate need of an upgrade. The UN is not a perfect body. And the crimes against peace are certainly missing that fifth crime, and I'm going to explain why. Also, the International Criminal Court only has four courts, courtrooms happening at any one given time. Now, given that you can go into any city in most country and discover a crown court has probably got four times that, clearly we need to rack up that system as well. But the beauty is, is that we do have that there. So we're not having to invent our wheels completely all over again. In fact, what I'm proposing is something that can be done relatively simply and quickly, and that's very important. It's just an amendment to an existing statute. We're not having to rewrite this all over again. We're not even having to create the new court. We could create a new court. There is a lot of discussion around an international court for the environment, which could be run on existing lines, along the same lines as the International Criminal Court. But the beauty is, is that we can build on what we've got, and we can upgrade that hardware. But most crucially of all is that we can input the software to make the cogs turn. And that's where ecocide comes into it. So David King, he talks, he's our ex-chief scientific advisor. He talks about the 21st century being remembered, remembered as a century of resource wars. He tells us we've already had Darfur, a war over water, Iraq, a war over oil. In fact, what we're looking at is a potential era of ecocide. Because what we have here is a hermetically sealed cycle of damage and destruction, what I call ecocide, which results in, amongst other things, resource depletion. And when we have resource depletion, it leads to conflict, which leads to war, which leads to more damage and destruction. And so it spirals onwards and upwards out of control. Oh. In fact, if I take you just back to that slide, what we're needing to do here is not slow down that cycle, but cut it. And that's very important, because slowing it down doesn't make things better. Doing it a little less is still an escalation. And so what I'm proposing is something that will slice that and stop it, rather than just slow it down. So this is the proposal that I've made. This is the legal definition I've given to the word ecocide. The word itself has been around since the 1970s. I haven't invented it. I'm just giving it legal definition. And in some continents, it's understood far more than others. For instance, in South America, ecocidio is something that's very alive to them. 
every day the Riziko studio happening. So when I was speaking at Cancun at the climate negotiations this year, I got a lot of coverage on, on front, front page coverage on their, their papers to make ecocide a crime spoke to an awful lot of people who were really at the receiving end of ecocide. Especially in particular, the second type of ecocide. And the definition I've given here is the extensive destruction, damage to, or loss of ecosystems of a given territory. And there are two types of ecocide. One, human agency. Two, other causes. So what we have here, human agency, what I call corporate ecocide, or other causes naturally occurring ecocide. I go on to explain to such an extent that peaceful enjoyment by the inhabitants of that territory and or any other territory has been severely diminished. Now, every term, every word that's been used here is legally weighted, and I'm going to unpackage this a little bit for you. Two different types of ecocide. So we have human-made, ascertainable ecocide, that which we can actually point a finger at and say, as a result of that activity over there, it is causing this damage and destruction. So we have mining, fossil fuel extraction, toxic waste dumping, deforestation. And one of the most uh, real-time uh, powerful ecocides that happened just literally three weeks after I had made this submission into the, the UN Law Commission was the BP Gulf oil spill. Now, up until that point, for three months, I had been tagging the word ecocide on Google to see how often it came up. And it would turn up just every couple of days, uh, largely an, an old academic text, or a very good book by Franz Bosmer uh, called Ecocide, dates back to the 80s. But after the BP Gulf oil spill, that word went stratospheric, and my phone started <laughs> ringing off the hook. But more than that, journalists were looking to identify this as an ecocide. And when they Googled the word, up came my website, and here was a legal definition. So it triggered a dialogue that happened very much in real time. And it seems to be not just a word, but a proposal that's very much of its time. Because we're looking to see who's accountable when we're, we're looking at these real-time ecocides. Other causes, naturally occurring ecocides. We have tsunamis, rising sea levels, floods, earthquakes, ecosystem collapse. What we're seeing is that naturally occurring ecocides is sometimes possibly triggered by corporate ecocide, human-made ecocide. However, in a court of law, that's almost impossible to establish. You can't possibly say that as a result of ExxonMobil's activity over here in the Athabasca tar sands, we then have rising sea levels over here with uh, the Kiribati or the Maldives. It's just not possible. In fact, what we're dealing with here is more a death by a thousand cuts, or maybe even three thousand cuts, and I'll explain why I say three thousand later. At the end of the day, what we're looking at is vast damage and destruction that's happening in many places across the world every single day, and it's the cumulative effect if we measure that in terms of excess greenhouse gases, then what we're looking at is an escalating level that it is argued is triggering unnatural catastrophic events such as tsunamis and uh, the loss of ice and therefore giving way to rising sea levels. Peaceful enjoyment. Why do I use that term? Well, this is a term that's very well understood through what's known as the tort of nuisance. So where we have a civil wrong, because ultimately this isn't just a crime of ecocide, but we're also looking at imposing a legal duty of care, a civil duty of care as well. So where we have a civil wrong, a legal responsibility that's been breached, and in this case when we're looking at ecocide, we're looking at the act of damaging and destroying, then it's the holder of that title the owner, if you like, over that land. Um, that is the person or the persons who have responsibility to those who reside there. Now, in my original definition, you'll notice that I use the word inhabitants. 
to such an extent that peaceful enjoyment by the inhabitants of that territory has been severely diminished. I haven't put humans quite deliberately because it's not just humans that live in a particular area or a given territory. There's a lot more life there outside of just human activity. So when we're looking at the tort of nuisance, we're also we're looking at the inhabitants of that territory. And I say that it's not just human beings, but all life that's within that territory that has that legal right to peaceful enjoyment, that right to life, if you, if you will. Now, while I was researching to see whether or not the international crime of ecocide could be put in place, what I discovered, most interestingly, was that we already have definition as to what is already a crime against the environment in wartime. And it's the Environmental Modification Convention that gives definition to what is damage. Now, the Environmental Modification Convention was put in place after the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War was the first war that was played out in real time on television, and it was recognized that it was absolutely untenable what we were doing. It was chemical warfare. It was white, orange, and blue. And it was understood that this can never happen again. For want of storming the castle, if you will, it was manifestly excessive. And we had to close the door to that. And so the NMOD was put in place, and NMOD set out the parameters to what that damage is. And if it succeeded, if it goes past that stage, then it must stop. So NMOD puts it as where you have damage and destruction over an area of several hundred, hundred kilometers, where it has impacts on ecosystems that Im impacts the systems over a period of three months or a season, and where it's severe, so that's involving serious or significant disruption or harm to human life, natural or economic resources. So it doesn't just have to be resources that have a price tag on them, but nature in and of itself, then that door is already closed under wartime legislation. Now, for me, this was very interesting because here I was defining uh, e ecocide as the extensive damage, destruction, or loss of ecosystems. Well, destruction or loss of ecosystems it is evidentially fairly straightforward to establish. You know, you can go on Google Earth and you can put in the word Amazon and you will see the extent of the destruction and the loss of ecosystems there. But damage is slightly more difficult to quantify. And for me, that was about looking at size, duration, impact. So to, to discover that during wartime, we already had a crime that dealt with damage and destruction intrigued me. Here under Article 8B eight, Article of the Rome Statute, which governs the four other crimes against peace, we already have as a war crime damage and destruction to the earth. Now, this is an anomaly. During wartime, we are prohibited. It is an international crime to damage and destroy over a certain duration, size, impact. And yet during peacetime, we're doing it on a daily basis. And it has been normalized under the law of contract between governments, between corporations. So I examined this further and I looked at this article. I said, this is very interesting because often what we do with law is we take law from one area and we transpose it into another. So, you know, here we take what we, we have prohibited during wartime. Why aren't we transposing this and putting it into peacetime and therefore making it all time? Now, this section is qualified. It's dealing with um, damage and destruction that's manifestly excessive. And that's where NMOD comes into its own. What is excessive? What is that damage? Well, that's the size, duration, impact. But it's also the recognition that to go in to storm the castle, you can't just spray chemicals far and wide. If that door hadn't been closed, we would not be here today. Chemical warfare would have escalated out of all control. So this has been a very powerful mechanism. We often don't recognize uh, law can be a very powerful preemptive 
legal mechanism. It closes the doors and we don't go somewhere. And I wanted to take this section and I wanted to transpose it because I want to take this into peacetime, not just wartime. So that word military obviously has to change. And so I changed it to corporate advantage. I thought, this is interesting. Let's look at the BP Gulf oil spill. Uh, was that damage and destruction manifestly excessive in relation to the overall corporate advantage anticipated? Well, what was the overall corporate advantage anticipated there? That was anything between six months and two years' worth of profits to the shareholders. Between six months and two years' worth of the, the, the use of the fossil fuel, whether or not to heat our homes or to be used in cars. And yet, what we're looking at after 10 weeks was damage and destruction over 700 square kilometers. What's more, it's going to have impacts on ecosystems far longer than just a season. And it's very definitely impacting not just on human resources, but natural resources and economic resources. So ironically, within wartime legislation, that sort of situation would already be caught. Now, whose interests are we protecting here? Actually, this is not about protecting corporate interests. So that really isn't quite the correct word. It's community, and not just the human community, because after all, men lost their lives in that accident, but it's also about the wider Earth community to all the inhabitants of that given area. Now, when BP went in uh, to deal with the oil spill, they decided to use a chemical, uh, chemical dispersant that hadn't actually been tested on an industrial level, Cortex. And that was sprayed from above uh, to break down the oil and take it underneath the surface so that it's no longer seen. In a way, that's a double whammy. So not only do you have the incident itself causing vast damage and destruction, but then you have a whole tonnage of chemicals being put into that area as well. BP called that operation Operation Kill. And that's precisely what they did do. In fact, that area of the sea is now named Dead Sea. It's been identified as Dead Sea. That's precisely what happened here. It was the accrual of silent rights, the right to damage, the right to destroy, the right to kill. So somewhere we're going wrong here. And this isn't even intended. There isn't an intent to go in there and say, OK, what are we going to destroy today? But it's arising out of a consequence of the pursuit of profit. Profit that's, that's actually coming out of damaging and destructive activity. Now, I'm not about corporate bashing, not at all. It's very important to me that we don't look at this as something where we just play a blame game. This is not about people who are willfully, you know, deliberately going in there to destroy the earth. But we do have a crime of consequence that has arisen and has become normalized under the law of ownership of property, of contract, where we've commoditized the planet. And so therefore it's perfectly acceptable to continue destroying. International crime also helps us in another way. Because what we have here is something that's known as the responsibility principle. Crimes against international law are committed by not just men, women as well but also, not crucially, by abstract entities. Now, this, this was identified and, and was enunciated in the International, Tri uh, International Tribunal at, at Nuremberg. And what was stated there was only by punishing individuals, so not the fictional entity, not the corporate personhood, but a human being, only by punishing individuals who commit such crimes can the provisions of international law be enforced. So it was a recognition that crime attaches itself to the human being, to the person, not a fictional entity. Because at the end of the day, a corporation is just a piece of paper. It's their articles of association, it's their charter. That's the fictional personhood that we talk about. Now, lots of people work within that. They come, they go. 
But with international crime, what we do is we attach that responsibility to the individual, the CEO, the directors, not just the corporation itself. And that's very important because a further principle which takes us, extends this is the superior responsibility. And this is also called the command and control provision. So the superior the rank of a given person within an organization, the higher the burden of responsibility they carry. Again, this arose out of um, World War II and the Nuremberg trials. But it was a recognition that nobody sidesteps their responsibility here. And it attaches itself not just to war generals, but also to constitutionally responsible rulers, to public officials, private individuals, to CEOs, to directors. At the Nuremberg War Trials, Frick, Frick was one of the people, he was, he was head of a, um, a corporation who financially gained out of the uh, movement of Jews to the camps. He was prosecuted as well. So it's a recognition that the higher the, the position of your responsibility that you hold, then the higher the burden you carry as well. And nobody can sidestep that responsibility. I want to take you back in time, in history, I, because I believe there are lessons that we can learn from past events. 200 years ago, William Wilberforce was the politician in Britain who took up the mantle for the abolition of slavery. And he recognized very early on that there were three things that needed to be done if we were going to outlaw slavery. First of all, he recognized there was no point going around everyone who had a slave and asking them to use their slave a little less. That's just energy efficiency, because after all, slaves were human energy. By the time he came along, there were over six million slaves that had gone through the system. This was not going to stop it, just asking people to treat their slaves a little better. He understood it was about turning off the tap upstream. So he said three things have to happen. We have to pool the subsidies. We have to outlaw it, and we have to give subsidies to those companies that could potentially lose out here. So we have to create new subsidies. Because it was very important to William Wilberforce that it wasn't about closing down the corporations. And I agree with this wholeheartedly. He understood that you make the problem into the solution. Now, those 300 companies were either directly or indirectly involved in slaves, either, either slave facilitating the, the movement of slaves or involved in the secondary industry, which was um, the first monocrop plantations, sugar. The sugar plantations needed an awful lot of slaves. And that industry was heavily propped up by not just uh, the British taxpayer, it was heavily subsidized, but throughout the world as well. So he said, pull those subsidies, move them, close the door to it, outlaw it, and give new subsidies so that those companies can create the new solutions, the innovation in the other direction. He didn't really want to see anyone prosecuted. He wanted to see these corporations go on and provide new solutions. Now, Wilberforce was hit with an absolute wall he was hit with people saying, never can we give up on slaves. This just will not happen. How can we even think about life without slaves? People just could not see past this initially. And industry said, look, we will have economic collapse right across the world if this is abolished. The public demanded, it is a necessity. There are no other solutions. There was this complete inability to think what the new world would look like without slavery. So industry proposed, most interestingly, self-regulation. They said, leave it to us. We don't want any more laws. Too many laws already. Um, any more laws is just cumbersome. We will, we will self-regulate. What we'll do is we'll cap the numbers. We'll limit them. Uh, and we'll create an internal trading system. In fact, a cap and trade will have tradable permits. Um, they said, we will tell people to use their slaves a little less, be more energy efficient, if you will. Um, one CEO suggested an improvement of conditions, pay for the bedding. Given that two-thirds of the slaves died on the boats on the way over, 
It wasn't the hay that was going to make the difference. But most importantly, what was proposed eventually was that if you really are going to legislate here, make it fines. Catch me if you can, laws. Because actually, we can litigate our way out of that one. Well, the difference between then and now is not much. Save that we're looking at 3,000 companies. And instead of it being blacks and chains, slaves, we're looking to, in effect, having enslaved the planet. Instead of commoditizing humans, we're commoditizing the planet and seeing to something that we can make money out of. Big difference is, is that in Wilberforce's day, all those proposals were laughed out of Parliament. And he died a happy man. Two days before he died, they actually passed the laws which began the abolition of slavery. Now, that's a man that didn't have Google or Facebook. He still managed to rally the troops on something that was seen to be absolutely impossible to happen in one man's lifetime, and he did it. And that triggered a whole chain reaction right through history, which has led up to the modern day, not just that, human rights, but also race discrimination. Now, that's not to say that we haven't gotten rid of slavery completely. That's not to say that we don't have slavery by other means and it's hidden. Girls being shipped in from Latvia for prostitution. But at least we have the legal tools of the trade to deal with this. At least it's no longer the norm. It's an exception. And we can do something about it. Now today, what we're looking at, the reason I use 3,000 companies is because last year, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity Report identified the top 3,000 companies that were causing damage and destruction to the planet. And they did a number crunching exercise in that. And what, what they discovered was a very conservative figure, $2.2 trillion for the year 2008 was the figure for damage and destruction that had been caused, that hadn't been remediated, hadn't been restored, just left. As in nine, it's expected that that number is going to double. So somewhere along the line, we're exponentially going in the wrong direction. Instead of less, it's becoming more. So clearly our existing laws are not fit for purpose. They're not working. And what's more, industry is coming out with the same proposals in terms of dealing with it through climate change mechanisms. The only difference is they were laughed at during Wilberforce's time. We've actually implemented these. And what we're now seeing is that that doesn't work. It hasn't worked. So now we're having to look for different solutions here. That thinking is not working. Now, I argue in, in my book, Eradicating Ecocide, that the crime of ecocide has to be a crime of what's known as strict liability. Lord Bingham was one of our foremost jurists in the UK, and sadly he died just a few months ago. Uh, was he alive today, he would have really understood where I was coming from. One of his last judgments, he actually explained why we put in place, and this doesn't apply just to the UK, but why we put in place crimes of strict liability. And I use this here because actually I think it sums up why we need an international law that it's nothing to do with knowledge. It's actually to do with the damage and destruction in and of itself. So Parliament, he says, creates an offence of strict liability because it regards the doing or the not doing of a particular thing as itself so undesirable as to merit the imposition of a criminal punishment irrespective of that party's knowledge. So ignorance is not a defence. It doesn't matter whether or not you knew or you didn't know. It's about closing the door because of the importance which is attached to achieving the result in which Parliament is seeking to achieve. And that applies right across the world. When we're looking at something that is mass damage and destruction on this scale that we're looking at today, and especially when we're dealing with a death by a thousand cuts, it's about closing that door. Also, strict liability is really, in essence, uh, in sentencing terms, the libertarian law. It's not about locking up someone for life. And if we compare, for instance, a death by dangerous driving as opposed to murder 
by using a car and driving over someone, then you see that reflected in sentencing provisions. Now, if we insert there the different uh, qualifications here, what I'm saying is that ecocide by damage or destruction would attach to itself a far lower sentence of three to four years rather than actually locking up people for life. What I'm wanting to do here is create a preemptive obligation, a powerful enough disincentive that closes the door. Incarceration is a very powerful disincentive. But there's a second thing here, because actually if we're going to start arguing that we need to demonstrate intent for ecocide, we can litigate that for a very long time. In fact, we'll create a whole new body of so-called lawyers who will be advising ecocide lawyers, who will be advising how to sidestep our responsibilities here. We use strict liability laws when we want to close the door to something. And we close it immediately. So there is an automatic assumption we just can't go there. It's not the way to go. So I'm actually saying that we need an international crime of ecocide where it's akin to the death by dangerous driving level. But also it's something that works as a very powerful mechanism. And this is because it is a crime of consequence. It is something that arises out of another activity. Unlike genocide, where you can see that there is an intent there, um, ecocide on the whole is not about destroying the earth. It's about creating uh, a preemptive obligation. Think before you act. It's also about the absolute prohibition. It's not the halfway house. It's saying we can no longer go there. We have to close the door to it. Also, we already have strict liability provisions for pollution or regulatory offences. So this is in line with something that we're dealing with already. Uh, and that it is something that is the most serious crime of all. And lower sentencing reflects that uh, lack of intent there. But also, it's about ensuring the highest standards. Where we have strict liability provisions in shipping uh, for pollution laws, what we see there is that now we have triple hull ships. So that if they do go bang in the night, chances are it doesn't spill. Well, it, do, it still does occasionally spill. But if it wasn't for that in the first place, you wouldn't have an enormous amount of money and research and innovation going on to how we create better ships to prevent the accidents from happening. One of the biggest problems with the BP Gulf oil spill is that it was cost-cutting rather than actually ensuring that those preventative measures were put in place. But also it's about addressing the consequence. The environmental impact assessment that was put in place, that, that, that was researched before BP went in um, to Deepwater Horizon, put the risk of an accident as very low. It's not risk that we're looking at here, it's consequence. When it does go wrong, how wrong does it go? So we shift the emphasis here to look at the consequence, the recognition that there could be. And so be it on your head then, if you're taking on something that could have enormous consequences. And when you look at it in that context, you make damn sure that you do absolutely everything within your power to make sure that does not happen. Or, better still, we start thinking about becoming a clean energy company instead. So ecocide is an international crime. This is about it flowing to all. The principle is called ergo omnes. You have an international crime and it applies right across the world. That principle was tested in London when General Pinochet came over back in 1998 to see his doctor. He was very ill. And the Spanish magistrate hot-footed it over the water to lay in information in Bow Street magistrates for crimes against humanity. And I was in that court building on that day. I was actually in that courtroom. And it was very exciting. We were all hoping that Pinochet was going to be produced from the cells. Actually, he wasn't even being held in the cells. <laughs> but his lawyers were there. And the argument was, in a nutshell, you can't touch me. I didn't sign up to this. Um, we don't recognize crimes against humanity. Well, that went all the way up to the House of Lords, who said, well, uh, yes, it does. This is an international crime, ergo omnes, it flows to all. 
And as a result, he could have taken it further, but then he was, he was taken back to Chile uh, and it was decided to prosecute in Chile, uh, prosecute him for crimes against humanity. As it was, uh, Pinochet died two days before his trial and, in fact, re recanted. So that trial never proceeded. But nevertheless, what we have is the testing of that principle. Because not all nations are signed up to the Rome Statute, but the Rome Statute attaches itself to all nations now. So it's also about putting in place an international crime which, when it's put in there at a top level, it's then transposed into national legislation. The International Criminal Court only steps in as a court of last resort. So it only steps in where a nation is either unwilling or unable to take action. It's about transposing, getting back to the sacredness of life, a moral wrong into a criminal wrong. There are two terms, Latin, ancient Latin terms, that describe this very well. Malum in se and malum prohibita. Malum in se means when something is wrong in and of itself then we make it malum prohibita, we close the door to it. And I'm saying that the vast damage and destruction to the earth is malum in se, and now we need to close the door and make it malum prohibita. It's also about attaching itself to the natural person, not just the fictional person. Now, yes, we can bring in the corporate aspect as well, the fictional corporatehood, and we can say, yes, let's, let's bring that on board for restorative provisions but it's about imposing that responsibility on that CEO, on those directors. Imagine, if you will, the international crime of Beacon Side I am a CEO. You are my directors. We are an energy company. What are we going to do? Are we going to go into the Athabasca tan, tar sands and uh, extract oil, unconventional oil extraction? Are we going to use fracking? Uh, are we going to use open cast mining? Problem is, I'm at risk of being prosecuted, me, myself, of Ecocide, as are all of you, my directors. In fact, our shareholders would find it absolutely untenable that we are contemplating a criminal activity. More so, the governments have all pooled these subsidies. The tune of $600 billion per annum goes into fossil fuel extraction at the moment. That's been pooled. What's more, they're offering even larger subsidies that we reinvent our wheels in the opposite direction. That bank over there and that investment pot is no longer available to us because obviously that head of bank is at risk of being prosecuted for ecocide for aiding and abetting. Because ultimately this is all about the flow of money. At the moment, the flow of money is going into damaging and destructive activity. Close the door to that and it opens up the flow of money to go into innovation quite a different direction. So why don't we invent, reinvent our wheels as a clean energy company? All our governments are going to help us with that now. That's where the money is going to go. And we'll actually, we need a heck of a lot of subsidies because this is a huge scaling up exercise we need. If we really want that clean green revolution happen, that clean green economy, it's going to need a huge job scaling up here. We're going to need to create a whole new industry, in effect, to deal with this. This means jobs for many millions of people. We're going to need assistance with that. It's also about a shift in consciousness. You close the door and another one opens. Overnight, when slavery was abolished, it went from being de rigueur to have a black and chains to being absolutely unacceptable. Something shifts within us. And, and not only do we get that rapid mobilization, but we get that assistance that's so desperately needed. Last year, I was in Edinburgh, where Royal Bank of Scotland were having their AGM. Royal Bank of Scotland is a British bank, which went from being just a national bank to being one of the biggest banks in the world in a very fast period of time, seven, seven years. And it nearly collapsed just as fast for investment in toxic assets and such like. Our government bailed out Royal Bank of Scotland to an enormous sum. In fact, it's not just the government that bailed it out, the taxpayer did. It's now 84% owned by the taxpayer, the British taxpayer. So in effect, it's become the People's Bank. 
doesn't act like a people's bank, but it is a people's bank. And at their AGM last year, there was a young uh, documentary maker, and he asked a very interesting question. He asked the head of Royal Bank of Scotland, why is it that you're using my money, taxpayers' money, millions of pounds of my money, to invest in damaging and destructive activity? And the head of Royal Bank of Scotland sat back in his chair and he laughed, and half the audience laughed with him and said, well, <laughs> it's not a crime. Now, for me, that demonstrated a synapsal gap in understanding. Morally, it is a crime. But because legally it hasn't become a crime yet, then it's perfectly acceptable to invest in that which is causing mass damage and destruction and putting humanity at risk, huge risk here. Now, imagine we're back to that point when ecocide has been made a crime. And that same uh, young man comes up and asks that same uh, head of the bank, why is it that you are not investing in damaging and destructive activity? Well, he will say, well, <laughs> that's a crime. I'm not going to go there. So you see how it can change and mobilize and actually crystallize our understanding. Law can act as a very effective lever in shifting our norms for society as a whole. I want to take this a little bit further, however, because this isn't just about corporate ecocide. This is also about putting in place a legal duty of care for often um, non-corporate ecocide, for naturally occurring ecocide. And this is about opening up a mechanism that is now standing defunct within the United Nations. We can put it back to good use. And that is the Trusteeship Council. The Trusteeship Council was put in place by the United Nations Charter back in 1945, after World War II, as one of the founding pillars of the UN. And remember, the United Nations Charter is the first ever international legal document that we have covering the whole of the world. And what it did with Article 75, it said, okay, we're going to set up a trusteeship council. And this is to assist territories that are in need. Now, these territories were old colonies. After World War II, we recognized colonization is no longer acceptable. We have to close the door to it. We're going to decolonize, in effect. If you look at colonization maps post-World War II, one third of land mass was a colony, one way or another. It's an enormous amount of land that had to be divvied up and returned and what have you. Now again, this was not a perfect process, but we do have a mechanism here that was used for those territories. Those territories were renamed. Uh, to call them ex-colonies was, was deemed politically incorrect and not terribly accurate. And instead, those territories were called non-self-governing territories. The idea was, was that we need to transition them into becoming self-governing territories again. And so to do that, rather than just a, a country walking out of a given territory and saying, okay, over to you, do what you like, there needed to be a form of assistance, a transition period to assist those territories before they could then become independent yet again and self-govern themselves. So that's what the Trusteeship Council was, was set up for. There's a huge room in the United Nations specifically for this. It sits 2,000 people. But after 1994, it became redundant. We got rid of the last ex-colony, the last non-self-governing territory. That was Paralab. And it now sits empty. We can't get rid of it because it's one of the founding pillars of the UN Charter. And I say we can put it back to use. Because, in fact, we can apply this to territories that have been adversely affected or are at risk of ecocide, because they are territories who will be in need. This is a legal me mechanism that imposes already a legal duty of care on all nations to assist, to provide for those adversely affected. And so what I'm saying is that being adversely affected here with ecocide allows us to use this mechanism all over again and we can provide for those who are most at risk of ecocide. Look at the Maldives, the Kiribati, 
here they are standing up in climate negotiations saying we're going to be gone in 15 years, help us. But at the moment, everyone's turning away and saying not my problem. Well it is, it is collectively our problem. When we have rising sea levels affecting small island nations, we all need to help each other here. It's not just about the next country helping, but all of us, collectively, putting into that pot, not just giving financial assistance, but giving any assistance that's required. And we can use that mechanism that's there. We don't even have to reinvent a whole new mechanism. It's there. We can open those doors all over again. And the reason it's there it's enshrined in what's known as a very ancient tenet of law. Written documentation goes back to the 16th century, but it's understood and it was talked about by Aristotle, and in fact it's something that in the indigenous world understands very well. The sacred trust of civilization. And the sacred trust of civilization is something that was Im embedded in the League of Nations, the precursor to the United Nations, and then was carried through into the United Nations itself. And that's under Article 73. And we've forgotten about this. We need to reinstate this. We need to re-remember that this is a very important legal duty of care we have. Members of the United Nations, so all member states, 194 of them, recognize that the interests of the, look at that word, inhabitants, it's not people, it's inhabitants again, are paramount. And accept as a sacred trust the obligation to promote to the utmost, so it's a primary obligation, the well-being of the inhabitants of these territories. So we're looking at a health and well-being provision, if you like, a fiduciary duty of care, not something that's about benefiting out of it for financial gain, but actually helping uh, inhabitants of a given territory, putting their well-being as the number one concern. What this is about is two very divergent approaches in law. What I'm talking about is on, as you're looking at it, I think, on the right-hand side of the screen, is trusteeship laws. But at the moment, we're very much stuck in the world of property laws, which is all about ownership. When we're looking at property law, law of contract, what we're looking at also is not so much protection of rights, but the accrual of silent rights, the right to pollute, the right to destroy, even the right to kill. And the problem is, is with the law of property, because it attaches itself to the fictional person, then the duties of that fictional person are very limited in law. And enforcement is very limited as well. It's really, it's largely fines on the whole. Who benefits out of that? Well, it's mainly just shareholders. But we have to look at multi-stakeholder engagement here. Who else is there out there? It's not just shareholders. It's not just human beings. It's not just the earth. It's not just indigenous communities. It's also future generations. It's also the earth itself. So we need to look at the wider earth community. And by using the principles of trusteeship law, then what we're looking at is applying guardianship, stewardship. If you look at laws that we have put in place for protection of children, you'll notice that it's not written upon the law of ownership, but they're written within the context of the law of trusteeship. Because after all, we don't own our children. And what we do is we impose a legal duty of care on those who have responsibility, superior responsibility, those who are the primary carers, to ensure that they act in the best interests of that particular child. So it's a health and well-being provision again. We impose a legal duty of care. We actually state what those obligations are, those duties and responsibilities. And enforcement comes with a cake. So imagine, if you will, you hear through your wall someone abusing a child next door, your next door neighbor. It gets so bad. You get round there and you knock on the door and you say, look, this has to stop. You don't ask them to do it a little less. You say, this has to stop. 
But of course, your neighbor is completely unreasonable. So he punches you in the nose. So what do you do? You go to the police. Well, you go to the police in the full expectation that they will do something about this. And indeed they do, because we have laws to protect children. And in fact, two things happen here. Because we've got the criminal sanction that we could be looking at uh, offences against the person. So a threat of the risk to life of that child. That, that, that man or woman could be up in charges for actual bodily harm, grievous bodily harm. Or worst case scenario, when things happen, you could be looking at something far worse than that. You could be looking at murder charges taken to its nth degree. But also we have civil proceedings, family proceedings. Uh, looking at what do we do? We put the interest of the child, the child's well-being is the paramount interest of the court. What are we needing to do? Are we needing to move that child into a safer arena, a safer environment? How do we ensure that that child's life is then protected thereon? So this is something that we already use within law. And it's the recognition that it's not about ownership. Ironically, it, it used to be that children were seen as a piece of property. Back in Roman times, you, you could throw your baby over the wall if you didn't want that child. There were no laws to say you couldn't get rid of your baby. In fact, up until 1990, in British law, a woman was just a chattel in marriage. She was just a piece of property. He was just owned by her husband. That caused enormous amounts of problems for women who were being raped and physically abused within marriage. They had no recourse to justice. That law was overturned in 1990 in a very famous case in the House of Lords, r and where it was recognized that this is a nonsense. Of course, women aren't a piece of property within uh, marriage. Now, that's not to say that all men are, are, had been committing abuse against women, not at all. But those that were, for those women, there was no recourse to justice. And their voice had been silenced as a result. But what I'm looking at here is that the earth's voice is silent. There's no one able to speak up on behalf of the earth until we recognize and put in place these legal mechanisms. So to summarize this, what this really comes down to is something very simple. How do you view the earth? View the earth as an inert thing, and what you do is you impose the value. You put a price on it, you use it, you abuse it, you commoditize it. That's all about the law of property. But view the earth as a living being, and something dramatically shifts here. Instead of imposing a value, we recognize the intrinsic value in and of itself. And that's about taking responsibility. That's about trusteeship laws. Ultimately, the crime of ecocide is not only a crime against peace, but it is a crime against humanity. It is a crime against nature. And it's also a crime against future generations. All of that, collectively, is a crime against peace. And that's why I'm fighting to have that door closed. Thank you very much. and stimulating and I've been reflecting on what a mammoth task ahead of us in terms of achieving um, criminalisation of the co -side. We have a little bit of time for comments and questions. I might go to Council first. Are there questions or comments from Council? How far could this be on, on a national level? If, it's, if it is actually um, accepted as ecocide on an international level, could this actually be sanctioned on a national level in the future? Yes, what happens is when you put in place an international crime, then it has to be transposed into national and international legislation. Uh, what we are doing uh, with the ecocide trial on the 13th of September in the UK is we're going to see how that will play out. But ultimately, this is a law that will never work just on a national level. I, literally, you will have 
corporations deregistering, if, if this was put in place just as a national law, you would just have companies going elsewhere and, and registering in other countries where they wouldn't have to adhere to this law. And that, that's very important, that we need to treat this as something where everyone comes to the, the playing field, uh, a, a level playing field, if you like. Because really, no nation comes to this with clean hands. Nobody does, in truth. Uh, and there has to be that recognition that put in place an international law of, of ecocide, what we do with international uh, legislation, uh, we do it in the EU and, and it's done across the world, is that you put in something like this and you then create a transition period. So you give time for countries to then bring their legislation up to speed. Literally, you get the red pen out and you cross out what has, it has to go. Um, you even have to sometimes write new laws. I, for instance, there's a lot of discussion around, well, transition enabling acts would be very important then, because you're looking at a period of transition as well. And it, it really is also about creating an, an ecocide amnesty, if you will. What you do is you say, okay, now this is law, but we give five years for all corporations, for all countries to get the legislation in place, and we pull the subsidies, but we put subsidies in the other direction. And you have, in effect, because this is going to affect the fossil fuel industry most of all, it is that you have a power down, but you have an end date where it's, it's going to end completely. And there's the recognition that we will need fossil fuel to a certain extent to power up with the innovation in the other direction, with the renewable energies and what have you. So you, it allows us to plan out. The sooner we put this in place, the sooner we can actually create that, that, that descent plan and, and that as ascent plan as well. And that's very important here. I, I actually do believe this can be done very fast. I think we have a window of opportunity here that's arising within society today where we've got collapse of climate negotiations. We've seen that using market mechanisms, if you go back a slide, two slides, to, to this property laws, this is where we've been stuck um, very much, that's where slavery was, that's, that's very much where climate negotiations were stuck in property law, law of ownership, who has ownership over you know, the greenhouse gases, the clean development mechanism projects, uh, and how do we trade this? So it's actually about saying, okay, well, we've got collapse here. Well, when we have collapse, innovation can come in from the margins very fast, and that's why there is such an enormous amount of dialogue, not just with um, a, the media around this, but actually more so, more importantly, with governments now uh, as to maybe putting this in place sooner rather than later. So the critical moment in time where we're saying we're getting stuck here, you know, existing ways aren't working. But more importantly, we're looking at something that's just an amendment. The Rome Statute only requires a two-third majority of the countries that are only that are signatories to it that's only 81 votes and where you have one vote per member state it doesn't matter whether or not you're america or the maldives your vote is equally valid and small island nations that are going to be most adversely impacted by naturally occurring or, or climate change ecocide are engaging on this are beginning to engage on this quite crucially so we're looking at maybe we can move far faster and get that body of support from over here. But it has to come from an international level, not a national level. It, it just won't happen at a national level. However, we do need that growing body of support from the grassroots. This needs to come from people, people calling on government saying, we want you to put this in place for our future generations. We want you to do this. We need to give government permission to act on this. Ms. Higgins, could you quickly outline the scale of support for this campaign? Where is it at the present time? Yeah. Well, there is enormous engagement around this and in some rather unlikely quarters. I, a lot of meetings I'm having with governments now are closed door meetings. But most surprisingly, I'm actually finding governments that I never expected engaging on this. And also lawyers who are advising governments as well. There is a recognition that it, ultimately this is not about the economic imperative. This is an ethical imperative that we have here. 
And given that we are now having, you know, the United Nations are really whistleblowing and saying we are at the brink of ecosystem collapse. A lot of governments are recognizing that you know, the existing thinking is not working. I think we have a window of opportunity here. We have the Earth Summit next year. I don't think we're going to get much out of climate negotiations this year at all. But the Earth Summit next year, that's being held in Rio, and that's 20 years since the original Earth Summit. Climate negotiations were actually put in place as a result of the original Earth Summit. And there were, 20, 19 years ago, a lot of international legal mechanisms on the table, surprisingly. But big business came in and said, we don't want to do this. Too many laws. Make it voluntary. The whole world of corporate social responsibility came out of the Earth Summit from, uh, from corporations saying, don't make it a law. We'll keep it voluntary. Now, we're seeing 19 years on that making it voluntary doesn't work. And so we now have an opportunity. We're also we're understanding things better as well. You know, the Earth Summit first time round actually had a new word in the vocabulary, and that was stakeholder. A book had come out quite recently before the Earth Summit, and that was a new word that was really a buzzword then. And the Earth Summit decided, well, who is the primary stakeholder with the Earth? And they identified just one, and that was business. Now, <laughs> we're in a world that we now recognize it's not just business that's a stakeholder here, and that it's multi-stakeholder engagement. Climate negotiations were set up on the basis, most unusually through the United Nations, that it was consensus building. And it was consensus building on the number of negotiators you could bring to the table. And that's dependent on how much you can, you can afford to pay negotiators. So the Maldives have five, America has 500. We have over 2,000 negotiators. Now, as a barrister who dealt with ancillary relief proceedings early on in my career, when I knew it was very difficult to get two people agreeing to anything over divorce proceedings, how on earth you get 2,000 negotiators agreeing over anything is destined to fail. And as we saw in Copenhagen, now, yeah, sure, this is a mountain to climb, but I think it's a manageable mountain to persuade just 81 nations to come on board. And something that's a growing momentum. We've got um, South America really engaging on this. South America, uh, Bolivia is now driving in universal declaration of the rights of Mother Earth in, into the United Nations. Ecocide is just the protection of the Earth's right to life. So we've already got a shift in dialogue happening here. And there's a lot of support for this in South America. Already, you know, it's not just Eva Morales, who's, who's, he stood up at climate negotiations last year in Cancun and said red negotiations, which is just creating market mechanisms, so really property law, but over forests, is governmental ecocide. You know, he's already talking this language. So there is a recognition, and yes, he was the only one that stood up and said that, but it's rather like the emperor has no clothes on. You know, you start to begin to see the picture in a very different way. And what I'm doing, I hope, is presenting another avenue that we can take. So I hope that what we can do here over the next year, I genuinely want to retire in 18 months and come back here and do a permaculture course and... Uh, maybe explore the country a bit more. <laughs> but I do genuinely believe we have a window of opportunity opening up to us here and now. And what we're wanting to do with the Ecoside trial on the 30th of September is position this as a very serious proposition and wake up big business to it as well, because we want to engage them in this. We want to engage them in the dialogue. And we want to say, okay, you are the problem, become the solution. This is looming over the horizon. It's a matter of when, not if now. Now, Wilberforce, it took him his lifetime. You know, he didn't have Google. He didn't have Facebook. We do. We've got Twitter. We've got different ways of messaging this. We've got far more transparent systems in place now. And we can galvanize people across the world. So I'm asking you to come on board and help me make this happen so that I can retire in 18 months.
Hi. Um, well, thanks, firstly, for your great presentation. Um, and we do have a question about... Um, you mentioned in your legal definition of ecocide that it could be caused by human means or it could be caused by natural means, in a sense. So I'm um, interested in as to how you see that would be played out um, and what kind of... Um, how that relates, I guess, because it's, it's hard to charge Mother Nature, I guess, with ecocide. So that's, that's our question. Yeah. Well, in essence, this, this plays out on, on two different levels, really. I mean, we're looking at prosecutions, so, uh, you know, the criminalising of it, but it's not just a crime. It, it's also that legal duty of care, and that's where the U, U Trusteeship Council really comes into play. I mean, it's a very powerful disincentive to governments to think that they could be hung, drawn and quartered for, for not actually a, taking a, a legal duty of care and assisting with territories that have been adversely impacted. But in truth, I, I don't actually want to see any prosecutions. I want this put in place so that we don't need to have any prosecutions. And maybe it's very interesting to look at how in Europe, um, well, in fact, in Norway, we had... What happened there was that uh, it was decided that if we were going to have true um, lack of sex discrimination in the workplace, then laws would have to be put in place to ensure that 40, minimum 40% of women sit on the board of directors. And what happened there was that there was a lot of research done beforehand, and they discovered that uh, industry said, well, you know, we don't want any more laws. <laughs> Um, you know, let, let us just do this voluntary. So they did research on this. They said, okay, great, we'll give some fine up funding and assistance for this. We're going to give training for women. Um, look to your own organizations. We'll train from within and outside and what have you. They put in place huge training programs, actually a lot of investment, a lot of subsidizing to make this happen. And what they discovered was the uptake was absolutely nominal. And that in reality, it was going to take hundreds of years if it was left to industry on a voluntary level to change things. So they said, okay, we're going to make it law. Simple as that. And uh, if you don't put it in place, uh, within two years, we'll give a transition period, two years, then we'll close you down. But we'll help you. We'll help you all the way. And in fact, we'll finance it even more. Well, the interesting thing was, and it really was that whole aspect that comes back to Wilberforce. You know, they said, well, this will lead to economic collapse. You know, it's going to be damaging um, public say that we need men. You know, it's a necessity that we have men sitting on board of directors. And so we had a kind of similar thing playing out here. Well, the most amazing thing was that after two years of transitioning, essentially creating an amnesty, the law's put in place, it's transitioned, we don't take any prosecutions except after two years. Only 12 companies failed to implement this. So another six months was given and another eight companies came on board. Those last four companies, Norway turned around and said, okay, we close you down. That's it. And it's as simple as that at the end of the day because, in fact, what happened was the whole country just normalized it pretty much overnight. And what we've seen there is that it's had fantastic impact on their economy, interestingly enough. It wasn't driven by economic concerns. But Norway survived through the recession very well, and they put that down in research to there being more balanced decision-making in the boardroom. Now, I'm not anti-men at all. I'm married to one, very happily. Um, but it is about balance that we're looking at here, and the sense that, in fact, once we start bringing in true justice, then we have something that kind of evens out right across society. There's now no perception of a glass ceiling for women. And moreover, they discovered that employee turnaround dropped away. I, uh, and they found that job satisfaction, both for men and women, was rated far higher as a result. So it seems to have knock-on impacts within society as a whole. But that just demonstrates on a kind of microcosm level how it plays out when we put something like that in place. In truth the majority come on board and then it becomes the norm. The conversations and dialogue around all of this in that country are that, well, of course we have women on the board now. Yeah, that's normal now. But you know, 10 years ago, that was very much not the dialogue that was happening. 
Yeah. Yes. Um, just have, I've got a lot of questions, but I'll just ask one. The, the question I have is, um, under your model of ecocide, who has the right to actually bring an action for enforcement of this international convention? In other words, is it going to be, I think you've talked about the model of prosecution. The question is, what right do... To enforce this this convention. Well, this is very exciting as well because uh, the International Criminal Court is a new beast. But unlike the International Court of Justice, where it's only member state to member state, largely trade disputes, so only a member state can raise it against another. With the International Criminal Court, there are four ways of raising the prosecution. So it can be raised by a member state. That's not likely to happen. You're not going to squeal on your neighbor, for truth. It can be raised by the Security Council. It can be raised by the prosecutor of, uh, prosecutor of his own uh, volition. Uh, and in fact, the ICC does this even when they sometimes do their own research. But most interestingly of all, it can be raised by an individual or a community or a group of people. Or, uh, prosecutions that have gone through the ICC have been brought as a result of letters that they have received from people saying we have crimes against humanity happening on our lands, we have crimes of genocide and our government's not doing anything about it. Now, I talked about hardware earlier, the idea that we really have to rack up the hardware because the ICC for last year had over 4,000 applications made to it. Now, 2,000 of that they knocked out pretty easily and said this does not prima facie me doubt. But that does leave 1,996 that haven't yet been addressed. And to have an international court that only has four courtrooms at any given time, it needs a heck of a lot of racking up, of, of, of expansion to take it to that next stage. So the mechanism is there. That is also normalizing a process that we never had before. It's actually saying, okay, well, it's the voice of the people that can be heard through this. So we do have that opportunity. We, tend, we seem to be going through um, a period of almost transition here where we're beginning to recognize that we, the people, have voice. And, and indeed, if you go back to the United Nations Charter, those are the very words that it starts with, we the people. The United Nations Charter was written for the people, not we the governments, not we the heads of state, but we the people. It's looking at international law for we the people, by we the people. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, there's a microphone coming. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. Thank you. It seems strange that we have to make laws for what seems so obvious, like But uh, the issue is, I see a bit of a paradox: is that we want to protect the, the planet, and we're all, we're all in for it. But the the places where we find the greatest ecosystems, the, the most intact, are usually places which are less developed. Yeah. Europe, North America. Largely cleared most of their ecosystems, and uh, so the, the third world. We say we can go up to New Guinea, or even use Australia as an example. Indigenous communities are saying we need the mines to come in. Uh, we'll have the resources that we can develop ourselves, and uh, you know a lot of other uh, worlds, other nations, as I see, they, they're almost forced to do this. The, the governments are allowing the big businesses to come so yeah. they can generate the money, they Absolutely. can pay back these debts. And debt is, is, can be seen then as a, a crime against the, uh, the, the planet as well. Yeah. And whether or not we could uh, try to tie that into ecocide, the, the, the method of debt being used to create the destruction. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the beauty of international crime is that it supersedes all of that. I mean, this, this is really getting back to, in fact, this slide, 
you know, what industry said back in, in, in Wilberforce's time and you know, what we're seeing again today, the same arguments. Actually, you know, in terms of fossil fuel and such like, you know, we know the solutions. That's not a problem, not at all. I mean, here you are, land, you know, living in a land of sun and you know, concentrating solar power is one of the most enormous solutions that we can have. 0.3% of the world's deserts can give us all our electricity requirements and, and you're sitting on a lot of land that could facilitate that. So it, it really is about actually getting past that economic imperative and by putting in place an international crime, it supersedes law as uh, profit as, as number one. Because this is the thing, it is the law to put profit first. You know, in the UK we have the Companies Act. It is the law that your number one overriding duty and obligation to your shareholders as a director is to ensure profit. Everything else comes second to it. So we have to put in place something that supersedes that, the umbrella legislation. Now, it sounds mad, but you know, at one time, genocide was not a crime. You could commit genocide in the course of business, <laughs> if you so wished. Uh, we had to outlaw that. It's the same thing. Now you wouldn't dream of thinking that the corporations would go in, well, most corporations would go in and commit genocide en route. You know, it, it is hopefully the exception rather than the norm. But it, it, it is actually literally about creating something that supersedes all other laws. It's, it's kind of like super law, if you will. And that's where international crimes against peace really comes into its own here. We have to tackle this and turn off the tap upstream so that governments, so that companies, it, it's, they can't argue this. It's about saying, well, that's irrelevant. But what's more, we help. We help those countries. You know, this is about skill sharing. That's about giving assistance. This is about, you know, the pot of gold and where it's handed out. So this is about the UN Trusteeship Council where you're looking at helping those that are in need. And the developing world is very much going to be in need here. Yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. there we go. Um, I just wanted to go back to that um, slide where you had um, the war crimes and the, where it said um, clearly excessive in relation to the overall military advantage anticipated. And you were substituting the word military for uh, substituting into that the word corporate. Um, I was just wondering whether that's the, the style of, um, of legislation that you were looking at. Um, bringing into creation and whether that then means that um, that the international um, court would be looking at that um, comparison between the advantage anticipated by the action and and the consequences of it to the environment? Yeah, well, this is again, how will this play out? And one of the reasons that it's such a, a great idea that... The, we're having a mock trial played out in, in the UK Supreme Court is to see exactly what should be applied. We literally are going to have QCs uh, you know, on both sides arguing, how do we measure this? Obviously the prosecution are going to be arguing, well we've already got an existence in wartime uh, a form of qualification here, we can apply it here. We've already got the NMOD convention that sets out size, duration, impact. And we have to wait to the day to hear what the other side have to say about that. I don't know what they'll actually come up with, in truth. Um, but we have some of the top lawyers in Britain scratching their heads on this to see, well, what, what can be countered on that? Is there something else we could put in place here? And that's interesting for me. You know, this is not to say that I've completely exhausted this. There may be something better we can put in place here in terms of qualifying it. But what I am doing at the moment is basically saying, look, that exists as a war crime. You know, here during peacetime, it's going on all the time. There's an imbalance. Something's wrong here. And we need to fill that gap. Just how we measure it out, I'm giving a proposal as to how we measure it out. But you never know. We may end up coming up with an even better proposal here. I'm, I'm perfectly open to that. 
In a way, what I'm doing is I'm starting a process. I'm giving legal definition to the term itself, but how we measure it is another matter altogether. And I'm giving a proposal as to how we measure it. Yeah. Hi. Working? Yes. Ah, okay. Um, so it's a bit strange. Uh, thanks, Polly. Um, I just had two questions, actually. Just quickly, how do you think this would affect industries like the fishing industry and agriculture on a broad scale? Um, and then my second question was, what would you say are three things that ordinary community members like ourselves could do to help your cause? Well, first of all, um, fishing industry uh, and fishing well, agriculture, you said. Uh, yeah, ag agriculture is very interesting because actually agriculture, especially when you're looking at huge monocrop plantations um, and GM, the use of GM, now, I, I say that is an impingement on life itself as well. You're modifying life, genetic modification. So, and you're looking at ma mass agricultural use of GM, um, monocrop plantations. So for me, that is an ecocide. I would argue that that is an ecocide. Uh, fisheries as well. You know, here we're looking at uh, vast destruction of the seas, literally trawling the seas. Now, I'm not an expert on fisheries law, but funnily enough, my husband is. Law of the seas is his big area, so you can imagine we have great conversations. <laughs> but he, he actually comes to the same conclusion as me. He, he says, uh, uh, actually, it's not rocket science. Especially in Europe, we have quota systems uh, based on this kind of artificial mapping of the seas, which is based on science that by the time it's applied, it's already five years out of date, and you know, what fish move anyway? And so he's very much, uh, he believes it's about actually stopping it. We stop fishing until we've worked out how properly to do this equitably and sustainably. And we allow those stocks to replenish, and only then do we go back in. And in a way, you know, sometimes it's the most simple solutions that really are the ones that work. It may sound radical, my goodness, we can't eat fish for a little while. But actually fish stocks, if they're given half a chance, replenish incredibly fast. We're talking just a matter of a few years. We've seen it in Scotland where we've had absolute prohibitions, and they do replenish very well. So it, there is this thing of, okay, let's stop that, not, don't go there, you know, uh, and criminalize it, uh, create the absolute prohibition. As for how to help, <laughs> well, you know, I, I always say, um, look to your own ecocides, you know, what is happening around here? In a way, just even turning around and identifying it and, and examining what is it for you that ecocide is about, I, uh, that is the starting point of recognizing it within that context. I'm also, I'm very keen to get people to engage in using this language to identify what's going on here. You know, if you're a campaign group and you're actually fighting your fight against whether or not it's fracking, whether or not it's mining or what have you, start holding corporations and governments to account. This is about accountability and saying, look, this is a crime. It may not be a legal crime yet, but morally it's a crime and it's fast looming over the horizon. And the problem is, what's happening, and I see this right across the world, is that we have every single day thousands of people engaged in fighting against their ecocides. And there's a fight going on here to stop this and a fight against that. And very often they are the same fights. But the majority are being lost because those small voices aren't being heard. Once we start speaking as one, and all saying, look, this is an ecocide, this is an ecocide, this is an, we want this to be outlawed, then what you have is a growing momentum from the people around this, and that's hugely powerful, and it becomes collaborative. You know, we're all in it together, we're all recognizing these different types of ecocide, and we're all starting to speak out about it. So I would strongly urge, and I've been talking to lots of activist communities as well, as, as I've been you know, talking in various countries, to say, Look, start using this language. Please come on board. And it makes it far more powerful rather than being a small group of people fighting against their activity over there. Once they start saying this is an ecocide and you've suddenly got support from a fellow group in another side of the world or another group who are fighting a different type of ecocide, then there is this whole build. And that allows governments to have permission to act. 
Now, I've heard this from quite a few meetings I've had with ministers in different governments saying, really, it's two things here that we need. We need it, the pressure from the top end. We need it, the legislation. But until we get the voice of the people, we're not really going to be able to act on this. So there is something about galvanizing the people and getting people to engage on this, and that's absolutely crucial. So, you know, go to the website, Eradicating Ecocide. I engage in around the trial, message it out. Uh, use your skill base in whatever way it means to engage in this uh, and to, to push it out as well. Getting media engaged on this as well is going to be very important, and that's what we're hoping to do by giving them an event with the mock trial. Please come on board. Um, I just saw one gentleman here. He had his hand up quite a few times. Maybe I could just ask him. I just think one last question before we come back. Um, I'm not a scholar, but I think I'm What is this gentleman here? No. <laughs> Voice. That's working. <laughs> I think a lot of us appreciate my, the only, uh, I feel it's important because in some ways I think the analogies you were drawing before with the anti-slavery campaign, there's a question that that was one form of property being replaced by another, but this time we're talking about replacing forms of property with values that we hold in common. Which I'm going to move to a much more specific question though around that, and that is who and how are we going to calculate these community values that are anticipated in terms of the, the, the legal measures you were describing. In particular, I guess I'm concerned about the questions, I guess, of opportunity costs for alternative systems. For example, permaculture and organic agriculture as opposed to industrial agriculture. A public transport-based system of transport as opposed to a car-based system of transport. Yeah. You've got very basic, I guess, questions of how to calculate what so in fact, the real gains they might be made out of entire alternative systems of production. Yeah. Th this is a very good question. This is also about, by shifting norms, when you put in place an international crime of ecocide, it, it opens up the way to how do we actually deal with communities. You, you're actually needing to get communities right across the world to engage in just different energy systems, different transport systems, different food produce systems as well. And suddenly you're looking at health and well-being of the inhabitants of your community. You're actually taking that you know, from an international level, international into a local level. And one of the things that I've been working on, and we're going to actually do a workshop around this on, I think, Thursday? Is it Thursday? At the Steiner School. Wednesday. Wednesday at the Steiner School. And anyone's welcome to come along. We're looking at kind of community, local engagement around this. Transition Enabling Acts. How to assist communities to be able to transition very fast, how to enable them. Now, enabling acts are a wonderful mechanism, legal mechanism. We use them in Britain in the 18th century to enable uh, the creation of canals. What happened was we discovered coal in a very big way. And it, it was realized that we just could not get the coal from the coal fields into the towns fast enough because you put a whole load of coal in the back of a horse, it collapses. And we just didn't have enough horses to accommodate this. Until one gentleman had a very bright idea that, well, you know, if we create a canal, the horse can pull the coal along the canal and can carry up to 400 times its own weight because actually it's the water that carries the weight. Now, the thing was, was that, of course, to create a canal, you don't want to have to go over hills and around mountains and what have you. You want to go as straight as possible, which meant cutting through property and ownership of land. And the government said, OK, we need enabling, canal enabling acts that literally go chop, chop, chop through that land and through that ownership, that property, because it's for the greater good of the community. So these enabling acts, canal enabling acts, within 10 years we had over 400 canal enabling acts in Britain. And it changed the face of Britain, and not just Britain, it spread right across the world. And this thing of adopting laws from other countries, America used them extensively as well, and various other countries. And literally what happened was it enabled 
call to be taken in to the cities. Suddenly we had innovation in, in the other direction. Suddenly we had steam trains. We had the advent of, of, of really traveling and moving around in a way that had never been anticipated prior to COVID. So we can use enabling acts again. It's the kind of slicing through the legislation that holds everything up. You know, permaculture, um, locally grown foods, this is the exception. It needs to become the norm because when it's locally sourced, it's low carbon. You know? It's also it's about a health and well-being provision. You're not using chemicals and pesticides in your food. It's also it's about dealing with infrastructure. You know, food is a very important piece of infrastructure especially when you start taking fossil fuel out of the equation, most importantly. Transport as well, different types of transport, public transport, transport that's not run on dirty energy, but instead run on clean energy. So we're going to be talking about that more and how that could work and what a Transition Enabling Act requires and, and how that would play out, but how we in, actually embed the intrinsic values, the health and well-being of all inhabitants into something like an enabling act to assist when the international plan of ecocide is put in place. Come along on Wednesday. I'd like to start by thanking Polly, and if you could join me in thanking Polly. Thank you.